Testament believers' response and responsibility to the Old Testament law. Romans chapter 4, we'll look at verses 1 through 5. It says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And the one who works does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's bow for prayer as we commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we open the word of God today. We thank you that it's powerful. We thank you it's sharper than any two-edged sword, that it goes to the very depths of our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that's our comforter, that's the one who challenges us, who convicts us. And through your word, faith comes through hearing. And we pray today that you will help us to come with open hearts, prepared hearts, be willing to receive from you what you have through this message. May it honor and glorify you in all that we do. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're pausing our study in the book of Galatians to speak about an elephant that's in the room that comes up when you read the books of Galatians and Romans. And the question that's been discussed ad nauseum for about 2,000 years of theological study is that what is the New Testament believer's response and then our responsibility to the Old Testament law? Now, why do I say response? Well, how we should live in this church age under the power of the Holy Spirit in consideration of the laws found in the Old Testament. The entire Bible is equally the inspired word of God. So how do we live considering the Old Testament law? And then what is our responsibility before God when it comes to living out that law? What does God expect and how do we fulfill his expectations when it comes to, for example, the Ten Commandments, which are the foundational uh, beginnings of the law? There's so much, so much material out there to read. I've, looked at, I've read over 300 pages there are so many websites, there's so many books out there in preparation for the sermon. It's, it's just the beginning, it's a thimbleful, it's, this sermon's an inadequate summary to the depth of the discussion on the subject, but what I'll attempt to do this morning is similar to what somebody would do when they take out an engine of a car, they take the engine and they break it down into its parts and they lay it all out piece by piece to be able to study it and to be able to understand how those parts come together to make a, a gas-driven engine that we use in our cars. This is no easy task. Now, some of us, you know, if you're like me, you don't care about all the details of the engine. Like Mike Lollidge, Mike Fenley, they like to know all these things and how to modify those things as well. Uh, but some of us, we just want to put the key in the car and get it started, and if the check engine light comes on, we go to the mechanic and we trust him, Right? This sermon's more about, okay, we're going to take about the parts of the law, grace, and gospel, and see how God puts it all together to work in the believer's life. So this should be a fascinating sermon for those who are interested in understanding how this all comes together, and we are thinking God's thoughts after him. How can we look back at all scripture, get an understanding of the law, and see how God puts the pieces together for us to serve and obey him out of love to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law that are given to us by God. So let's first attempt in an abbreviated way to define the law as used in the Bible. So I encourage you to take out your outline. And uh, for those that don't care about the details, well, wait till the third point because that's applicable to all of us. But I hope that you get a grasp and understanding, first of all, how the law is defined and used in the Bible. First of all, you see in your notes the Ten Commandments. The laws that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai by God. But second of all, we see the civil law of the Old Testament that was given for the Jewish nation in Leviticus 11. And I've given you these verses. This is really a study guide to go home and dig into in a deeper way because there's no way we're going to get to all those verses. But the civil laws are the laws God gave to the Jews on how to govern first in a government known as a theocracy where 
God is the ruler through the prophets. But then in God's permissive will, he gave them ways to conduct themselves when they decided to have a king, Saul being the first king. That was his permissive will, not his perfect will. These laws do not pertain to the believer in the church age today because we are not Israel. Israel has a bright future. Israel has uh, revelation, tells you all about it. And Romans 9, 10, 11 tells you about the future of Israel. But these civil laws pertain to them in that specific period of time. Second, third of all, the ceremonial law was given to the Jews for worship. For worship. How to worship in the wilderness. How to worship when they got to the promised land. It says in Leviticus 6, 9, here's a, an example Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar. So there were specific things that Aaron and the priests, in this case, were to do that were ceremonial, that were part of their worship that pertained to them at that time. Fourthly, some people think of the law as the first five books of the Bible. The first five books of the Bible. In Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And here's the key part. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The law and the prophets, primarily found in the first five books, we know it as the Pentateuch. Some call it the Torah. Some call it the law. And the gospel is found in the Pentateuch along with the law. This is really interesting to study. In Genesis 3.15, we see the first picture of the gospel. John Piper says, If I should say there is a clear distinction between the law and gospel in the Bible, then what I would be meaning by law at that moment is not the first five books of Moses. Now, why is that? Because the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, includes Genesis which contains the Abrahamic covenant where Paul says, God says, that Abraham was justified by faith in Genesis 12 and in 15. And Paul uses that text to illustrate the gospel in Galatians 3.8. The scripture, it says in Galatians 3.8, he quotes from Genesis 12, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel. There it is. John Piper says, so the Pentateuch is preaching the gospel in Genesis 12, and all, you all, the families of the earth, shall be blessed through Abraham. So the Pentateuch preached justification by faith, preached the gospel, and pointed to Christ when it did it. And then in Galatians 3.17, Paul said, the law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. So now you've got within the law of the law. And so you've got to clarify what the law you're talking about. Do you mean the Pentateuch and its message? Or do you mean the specific commandments of the Mosaic Covenant, which coming 430 years later after Abraham, doesn't annul the covenant made with Abraham and is used by Paul to illustrate the gospel? So basically, in summary, he's saying the better way to say it is this. The Pentateuch contains both the law and the gospel. The law and the gospel. Number five, how else can we define the law? Any statement in scripture that condemns or makes a person feel guilty. Romans 4 says, for it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. I'm sorry, let me read it again. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. The law shows us that we are condemned and that we need a savior. Number six, God's word in general can be considered the law. And James, it says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, bearing, um, perseveres, bearing no hear, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The perfect law, the law of liberty. Number seven, the righteous standard of the moral law. So the Pentateuch, the Torah, teaches ceremonial law, how to worship. It teaches civil law, how to govern themselves and live in relationship with one another and through a theocracy. But it also teaches a moral law, 
which does apply to us as New Testament believers. In Romans 8, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Another thing when you think of the law, it has defined in the Bible a principle or a fact. Fact is the underlying word there. It says in Romans 8, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And lastly, for Christ's command for believers to love one another. This is an example. The one another's could be considered in the New Testament part of the law. And here's one example. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. And then he says, so fulfill the law of Christ. This is all taken from a book called Law and Grace by Myron Houghton, if you want a reference, a source there. So the application here is to discuss the law, the gospel and grace requires first an understanding what is meant in the Bible by the law. We have to understand these definitions for the platform to be able to move on to points two and three, to be able to understand when they speak of the law, there's so many aspects you have to consider. That point is the foundation to what we're going to talk about next. Secondly, how does the law, gospel, and grace work in the New Testament. Now, you'll see this up on the screen, but you've got this nice little chart, two charts, two little things, boxes there. This also is from Myron Houghton. He does a wonderful, masterful job. I want to take a moment to just focus on those. So the law has several purposes, and we'll talk about that. One is to show us how to live holy lives for God. It also is to show us that we can't live up to that standard, but it's also to bring us to the place where we need the grace and the gospel to help us solve the problem of sin in our life. So in your box there, law, law makes demands. It shows us our guilt before God and causes us to be afraid of God. We see our sin and we see the consequences of it and we concerned about what are we going to do. We know Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That at the end of our life, we're going to have to stand before God and he's going to demand a payment for our sin. That's a fearful, fearful thing. Then we look over here in grace and gospel is a subset really of this box. Gospel does not make demands, but it refers to Christ's death and resurrection and the benefits that result. And it's wrapped up in this whole thing of specific grace to the believer. And it's found grace as a rule of life makes demands. They cause us to fear the consequences of our disobedience and produces sorrow for failure. Generally, grace motivates believers to obey out of love for what the Savior did for us. So we see on your outline next, God's anger is on those who suppress the truth. God's anger, I, I, I added some things there to it, but it should really say God's anger is on those who suppress the truth. You can cross out the rest. As uh, I, we looked at this and we, as elders and we realized that's really the, what the gist of the scripture says in Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God gave the law. There's truth found in it. Jesus is truth and his sayings are truth. People disobeyed or suppressed the truth due to their selfishness and their sinful nature. They're bent towards sin. So God's anger is on those who suppress the truth. John 3, 36 says, the wrath of God abides on him who does not believe on Jesus Christ. Every person who's alive right now that's not a believer in Christ has the wrath of God on them because they're walking in darkness and they're walking in their sinful ways. Second subpoint here, the law was given to reveal that every human being is in sin. It's to reveal that. That's one purpose of it, to make sure that understand that we cannot live up to it in our own ability. They were born in original sin. They were born with this bent toward doing what we want to do, that we are selfish left to ourselves that we want to be independent of God. Therefore, God provided a sacrificial system to make up for the fact that man cannot keep the law but needs to have a blood sacrifice uh, 
to be forgiven and to have the sins, the failures to keep the law, covered in the Old Testament, but then removed in the New Testament by the cross of Christ and his work there. This is very important. The third one, the law was a tutor. If you look at different translations, some will say a guardian. Something that brings you to Christ and his salvation. You see, it brings you right up to the doorstep saying, you've got this problem. You can't solve this problem. And now I'm going to point you to the Savior, to Christ, who can solve this problem of sin. The law was never, ever intended to save. Let me say that again. The law was never, ever intended to save. It was to bring us to Christ. It was to provide a moral code for the Jews to live a holy life acceptable to God And then when they failed, the sacrificial system, which pointed to a Messiah who would die on the cross, the shedding of blood was necessary to cover the sin. Now think about it. It began in the garden, even before the law was given. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? And then God comes walking along in the garden. And what does God say? Adam, where are you? Adam's hiding because his conscience told him that he had sinned And he couldn't be be in front of a holy God like he had been in the past. So what did God do? To remove the shame of Adam and Eve realizing their nakedness, he killed animals and he covered their nakedness. That was the first act of shed blood to sacrifice for sin. And that was before the law. So over time, the law was given for the Israelites to live in the wilderness And then when they possessed the promised land, then they had a really big problem as they tried to decide how they were going to follow the law when they were brought into captivity by the Assyrians and then later the Babylonians. Next we see with or without the law, man's conscience tells him what is sinful and what is not. I already alluded to this. Look at Romans chapter 2. Now realize, the law came to the Jews, not the Gentiles. So Paul says, for when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. You and I, part of being made in the image of God is that we have a conscience. And when kids are young, at a certain point, they begin to know innately what is right and what is wrong because we have that conscience within us. Now, we as humans can sear that conscience. We can do things over time to make it insensitive to us doing wrong things. But in the innocence of a child... At birth, we have this thing called our conscience. And Adam and Eve, as I mentioned, nobody told them that they sinned, right? They ran and they hid from God. Something told them it was their conscience. Max Lucado in his book, Six Hours, One Friday, tells how the U.S. government in 1811 began collecting and storing letters like the following note dated February 6, 1974, Quote, I'm sending $10 for blankets that I as a soldier stole while in World War II. My mind could not rest. Sorry I'm late. End of quote. It was signed in XGI and there was this postscript. I want to be ready to meet with God. The U.S. government not only collects and stores these letters, but the Treasury Department established a fund and labeled it the Conscience Fund. Since its inception, the fund has grown to almost $7 million. A lot of guilty people out there. And then we see the next point here, receiving God's gift of salvation as unmerited favor, grace by faith is what makes a person righteous. The law shows us we can't measure up. That's the standard of righteousness. But we receive it when we receive Christ as Savior, when he imputes that righteousness within us in the Holy Spirit. In Romans 4, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift But as is due, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. On May 1st of 2009, at the 135th running of the Kentucky Derby, 
a small horse named Mind That Bird entered the race at 50 to 1 odds. Mind That Bird had not fared well in its two previous races. So it was no surprise that the long shot horse struggled from the start of the race. Mind That Bird and jockey Calvin Burrell got squeezed between the other horses and quickly dropped into last place. At the first quarter mile stage, Mind That Bird was still running dead last. In fact, he was so far behind at one point, the other horses that the NBC announcer, Tom Durkin, missed even seeing him on the track. But at the three-eighths pole, Mind That Bird started gaining on the other horses. And after passing atomic rain, the horse took off. As Burrell rode his horse around the eighth pole, he guided Mind That Bird between the rail and another horse. And from that point on, Mind That Bird took off the victory, winning the mile race by six and a half lengths. The victory stunned the horse racing world. Even Mind That Bird's owner said that victory wasn't something that was even on our radar. Another horse owner said, I was like, what happened? It was a shocker. But Mind the Bird's jockey, Calvin Burrell, he wasn't shocked. When asked what happened during the race, Burrell simply said, I rode him like a good horse. Mind the Bird won the race because a higher authority, Calvin Burrell, rode him as if he were a winning horse. And like Jesus, Burrell calls into being something that was not there previously. Jesus brings his righteousness and puts it within us. So I hope you understand that illustration. It was imputed him through the rider that he thought he could win. Faith in the grace of God, not the law, saves. Faith in the grace of God, not the law, saves. In Romans 4, we're going through sections of that chapter today. Verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there's no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Gentile, Jew, those who believe by faith in the grace of God that's transformed our lives, born again. Like I said before, the purposes of the law were to give a moral code that could not be lived up to perfectly, perfectly, but second, the law was to bring us to Christ in order that we could trust in the finished work of Christ to receive God's forgiveness and righteousness, as we'll see in a few moments, to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. What a privilege to know that even though we can't measure up, but the grace of God has brought us to the solution, and by faith we've had the opportunity to receive it for ourselves. Think of so many who are still lost in darkness and in their sin and haven't been brought to that place to receive the grace of God. Abraham was justified by faith in God's grace and not the works of the law, and so are New Testament Christ followers. We are just like Abraham. Verses 20 through 25 of Romans 4, Paul says that. No unbelief made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Verse 24, look at that. It says, for ours only, our righteous standing before God. Isn't it amazing that since the beginning of time, At the onset of scriptures, God was setting up a way that we could be given grace to be saved and to receive the Holy Spirit to give us that imputed righteousness. What an amazing grace. What an amazing plan. And you study world religions. No other God would write a story like this except for Yahweh, Jehovah. The reason we can be justified is that we put our faith in the shed blood of Christ to remove our sins. And 
Romans 5, 9, he says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. What a great promise. that We celebrate. and We think about during this Lent season, the sacrifice of Christ and his shed blood, that we don't have to face the anger of God as we try to make a payment for our sin at the end of life and our own abilities. So the application is this. It's up to us as Christ followers to understand the relationship between the law, the gospel, and grace. It's up to us to understand the relationship between those three things. So let's turn now to how these teachings apply to us this morning. This is where I hope everyone will be engaged if you didn't care about all the minutiae we just went through, but here's where this is applicable to all of us. How should we live in light of the Old Testament law and walking in the Spirit with grace? First of all, Christ's followers have died to the law and its demands. The law was given to the Jews for a specific period and purpose until Christ came and fulfilled the law and gave the new covenant as prophesied, as predicted in the Old Testament. You've got it there. You can look it up, Jeremiah 31, 31, and it's in other places as well. But I'm going to turn to 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, the law, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. In the future, Israel will turn to the Messiah. They will enjoy the new covenant relationship with him that we as believers have already. And Paul, who was a Jewish believer, found himself no longer under the law, but he followed the law in the presence of Jews to be a bridge to the grace found in Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. You read that entire chapter, he talks about his different ways of doing evangelism. He specifically talks about the Jews here in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 9. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. Notice in parentheses, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, and I might win those outside of the law. Paul wanted to identify and be relevant to his fellow Jews who did not believe in the Messiah. He loved them so much, as it tells us in Romans, that he said he would be willing to spend eternity in hell if it meant that his brother, Jewish brethren, could come to faith in Christ. That's why he said with all his heart he wanted to live under the law with the Jews even though he was not obligated to in order to win them to Christ. Christ followers now walk in the law of the Spirit of Christ based on grace. Grace, that unmerited favor, that gift that's given to us. Romans chapter 8, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The righteous requirements of the law are fully met by the Holy Spirit indwelling the Christ follower's life. The Holy Spirit is how it all happens. We cannot do it in our own abilities. John Wesley, that famous preacher, founder of the Methodist Church, said this, there is therefore the closest connection that can be conceived between the law and the gospel. On the one hand, the law continually makes way for and points us to the gospel. On the other, the gospel continually leads us to a more exact fulfilling of the law. The law, for instance, requires us to love God, to love our neighbor, to be meek, humble, or holy. We feel that we are not sufficient for these things, yea, that with man this is impossible, but we see a promise of God to give us that love and to make us humble, meek, and holy. We lay hold of this gospel, of these glad tidings, and 
It is done unto us according to our faith, and the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. End of quote. So the law of the Spirit of Christ frees the Christ follower from sin and death. That we don't have to suffer the consequences of not keeping up with the law. The law of the Spirit of Christ frees the Christ follower from sin and death. We now possess the law of the Spirit of Christ, which has transformed us. And he shows the contrast, the law of sin and death. Sin, which controlled the body. Look at Romans 7. Paul's amazing statement talking about the sinful nature that's within him. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He talks about this fight that when we receive Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in. And we now have this tug of war going on where we have a new nature. And that old nature is still there. And the one we feed the most is the one that's going to be the strongest. He talks about that struggle that we face. And then we see the Christ follower is saved by God to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law by walking in the Spirit. He says in Romans 8.4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There are lots and lots of places to go in the New Testament to see that Jesus not only observed and fulfilled the law, but by the promised Holy Spirit, he wanted us to exceed what had already been written in the law. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said in the Sermon of the Mount, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, the smallest punctuation found in the word of God will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, this is the key verse here, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why we need a Savior to give us the Holy Spirit, to give us that new nature, to indwell us with that imputed righteousness. Last point here, the Christ followers' obedience to the law of the Spirit of Christ is based on love and grace powered by the Holy Spirit. See, it's not under the law to be saved, to be made in the image of Jesus. See, it's not salvation that we find in the law. It's not even our sanctification, our becoming more like Christ. It's not guilt and fear-based as the law brings, sin and death, but fulfilling the righteous requirements of law enabled by the Holy Spirit. Charles Ryrie wrote this in a book called The Grace of God. He said, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. This does not mean that there is no law in this age of grace, Quite the contrary is true, for the New Testament epistles speak of the perfect law of liberty, the royal law, the law of Christ, and the law of the spirit of life. It is the commands contained in these epistles which compose the law of Christ, and it will be recognized immediately that there are hundreds of such commands covering every area of Christian living. Not only are these teachings extensive, but they are so definite that they may be termed a law. This application is so important as we come to an end of this message. Fulfill the law of Christ by grace and the Holy Spirit by obeying the law. Here's the difference out of love in response to all God did through Christ or to all God through Christ has done for us. You see, the response is out of obedience. The law is a fearful thing. The law makes you think there's a God up there with a hammer waiting for you to step out of line and he's going to punish you and there's going to be wrath and anger. But the good news is the law of the Spirit of Christ that we possess as believers, we obey the law of Christ out of love because of what Christ has done on our behalf. See, the motivation, the perspective is completely different. 
But we also know that we don't have to do it ourselves, that we have that abiding power of the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power that enables us to fulfill the one another's, for example, in the New Testament. So here's our key thought. Every Christ follower must now live in the law of the Spirit of Christ received by grace and obeyed in love. And here's the contrast. In contrast to living by the law that breeds guilt, fear, and a merit-based attempt to be like Jesus that falls short. As I said last week, we need to live as if we're not condemned, that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us, that we become more like Jesus as we rest and abide in the power of that Holy Spirit, knowing that we are able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law because God has granted us the ability to do that through his grace. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you how it all fits together like a giant jigsaw puzzle as we begin in the Old Testament, move to the New, how your redemption story begins early in Genesis, woven through the law, the sacrificial system. In Isaiah 53, pointing to that suffering servant who would come and be the final sacrifice. And then to be given the promise of the Holy Spirit to be given to us so that when we're, what we were unable to do in our own ability to keep the law, you fulfilled them through your Holy Spirit living in us to be able to do the righteous requirements of the law to please you. Fill us with joy. Fill us with expectation. Fill us with confidence and hope knowing that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives if we know Christ as Savior to enable us to obey and follow you out of love. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.